Welcome to the North Shore Nine podcast. I'm Ryan Alexander. With me, with a, a special guest here, John Parado of a couple couple things here: Pittsburgh Baseball Now, Draft Nation, Forbes.com. John, thanks for joining me on the North Shore Nine. Oh, my pleasure, Ryan. Good to yeah. be with you. You are, uh, you know, I don't want to give you too many accolades right off the bat here, but you're like a, a legend in the Pittsburgh sports <laughs> journalism world. I mean, you've been covering this team now for what? 37 seasons? 37 seasons, yeah. yeah you, you've seen it all. You've seen it back from, what was, the, what was that first year then? 80, 1988, 88. when they were kind of on the upswing. They'd almost been sold to out-of-town interest three years earlier, and they, they went from that to, uh, they hung in the race into the end of July with the Mets. They still ended up in second place in the National League East, which was a, a big jump considering where they'd been the previous years. Did you? And how many winning seasons have you seen? Seven out of 37. So now when you started, did you ever think you'd only see seven, seven no. seasons if you went that long? No. So you I, said they were on the, they were on the up. They were on the, they were on the rise in 88. They had Barry Bonds, Bobby Bonilla, Andy Van Slyke, Doug, uh, Doug Drabeck, John Smiley. I mean, Jay Bell. Uh, well, no, actually they didn't get Jay to the next year, but I mean, they had, they had talented right. all-star type players and also some good, complimentary players and they had a really good manager in Jim Leland and you thought that they were going to win forever and of course in 89 they had a bunch of injuries right out of the uh, gate the first week two weeks of the season that kind of become a lost season but in 90 they turned it around and they won three division titles and you know I knew they wouldn't win every division title for the rest of the years however many years I covered them but but I certainly didn't think uh 31 year, 32 years later, they wouldn't have won yet one division title in that span. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a while, and you know, just a this is kind of a, a one off show we wanted to do here, bring you on. Um, I, I think you know, I met you back when I interned with the Pirates back in 05, and we've met at baseball you know winter meetings, and I've always enjoyed talking with you, and you just have so many stories from back then that you know I don't I don't see you too much as far as like on Twitter or as far yeah. as like video. Yeah. So I think a lot of people would enjoy, uh, hopefully enjoy this conversation we'll have. And, and I, you know, I just, I, we're, we're live here at Robert Morris. So I wanted to give the shout out there as well uh, to hear their, their video podcast studio. Um, but yeah, I mean, just your, your career from late 80s till now, you've seen so much. Um, yeah. What's kind of like the biggest changes you've seen from when you started till now? I mean, you know, as far as technology wise mm-hmm. or how the business has changed and, the teams, you know, the players, just everything. It's quite different. And I'm sure uh, our producer here today helping us out, Casey Erlewine, uh, who's younger than both of us, considerably will be thinking that I was in the Stone Age when I started. <laughs> but, right. well, from I guess first from a very overview basic thing is the organization was a much better spot than when I started right, right. than when it is now. Uh, I mean, they were, they were starting to win, as we just touched on. Uh, Player relations were different. I, I don't think we were considered the enemy necessarily. I'm not saying that the the, the writers, the media, were, were uh, you know, I wouldn't say we were friends with the players. You know, like we didn't hang out. We didn't buddy-buddy after right. the games and stuff. But also there wasn't that wall that was put up between us where, you know, they were all leery of all of us. And I think it but would also – you have to keep in mind there was no social media then. Uh, yeah. There were no all sports stations in Pittsburgh. There was uh, KBL was the uh, regional sports network, and all they did basically was come on the, with the start of the broadcast and got off at the end. They didn't have pregame right. or postgame shows, so they didn't have reporters in the clubhouse. Yeah. And uh, it was basically four or five of us who covered the team for you know for newspapers or or in the Associated Press's case a wire service and most of the players got to know us and they 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 knew our names they knew who we worked for and and you know I mean and they're, just because they were around and there wasn't as many of us I think they kind of learned to to trust us they knew that. Like, we weren't going to burn them. We weren't looking to burn anybody. But we would write the truth if something bad happened. You know, you couldn't ignore it. But I think uh, they, they weren't a little scared, like today, of being ambushed by somebody they don't know. And uh, from a technology standpoint, we used to have uh, – it was a, a, a computer. I'll try to show it to the people watching out there. It was about this big, this big, 
It was a Radio Shack, made where it was Radio Shack, a name from the past. Yep. And they were called TRS-80s, and you could type on them, but they only had six lines that you could see. You couldn't see half, hardly any of your story. And then you were done. They had uh, they were called acoustical couplers, and you you pl- you plugged your you you plugged the, the coupler into the phone, dialed the dialed the number. There was a special number back. I worked at the Beaver County Times then, but it was general for other people who had different. You know, at their offices there was a line, and you had to put the phone into the couplers. And about 60% of the time, they didn't work. And it seemed like the one time they didn't work was when we were right on deadline, like five minutes from right. deadline. And, and, you know, we'd be in. So, uh, so, yeah, that, you know, there wasn't email. There wasn't the Internet, things like that at that point. And uh, so it's changed. It's changed a whole lot. I mean, it's changed gradually. So, right. you know, it hasn't like just from one day it went from this to this, and it was just a stunning change. But over time, when you sit back and you think about how things were in 1988, and, you know, I, I don't spend a whole lot of time reminiscing about it, but, you know, somebody asks and I think about it, it truly is amazing how, uh, how the, the whole setup right. has changed since when I started. BetOnline is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything sports betting. Every stat, every matchup, breakdown, and even live odds and spreads to bet on door in the games with the largest catalog and odds of um, everything from football, MLB playoffs, NHL, NBA, to political props. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or on one with one of our over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get on the action with America's most trusted site for online wagering bet online the game starts here yeah and you know i it's we've it's a love-hate relationship with like twitter like i love yeah. twitter but twitter might be the worst thing like out there as well just with everything yeah. on it but do you think you know talking about how like you said there was a there wasn't a wall up between you guys and the players and everything back then do you think um was that is that do you think social media played a role in that as far as like oh, oh they, yes you know people are more outspoken the players can can talk you know to, to fans if they yeah. want to and stuff you know Andrew McCutcheon blocked uh, Donardo this this summer yeah. uh, on a tweet he said so you have that but or do you think it's just like a generational a difference in that or, or what I, I contributes think, to I that? think it's a generation generational difference but you're right i mean fans have much more easier voice when when i started if a fan wanted to have their opinion out there they either called a talk show and then there were only a couple of sports talk shows in 1988 myron cope had his show on wta and myron of course has been gone for a long time now and there were a couple other talk shows in town but basically you either called one of the talk shows or you wrote a letter to the wrote a letter to the sports yeah, editor yeah. Uh, and you know we used to run those every sunday in the beaver county times for sports so if you wanted to voice your opinion it wasn't as easy as typing a couple words and hitting send on your phone right. i mean you had to work at it a bit you had to make a phone call you had to write a letter and i think now everybody can just immediately share their opinions and and i, I have to believe there's some people that do this and after they hit send and they think about it a couple minutes later they probably said i should have done that but yeah and i I think it's tougher on the players it's tough as tougher on us in the news media i mean you know know, people there are people out there that just just can't wait to pounce on anything i write or or other people write or anything you guys say on your shows and in your you know on on your site and and that's that there's more vitriol than there used to be it used to be the biggest vitriol was fans booing or or maybe like i said somebody writing a nasty letter to the editor and now it's just so easy to do and and you can do it anonymously and yeah so social media has had a big impact and the other impact i think it's had ryan is is like you said players can speak directly to the fans now they really, and I hate to say this, but they don't need us to 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 p- make their views public to to the fans. True. And I think the other thing that people worry about, and there was a pirate about ten or fifteen years ago now had a wedding, and some of the help at the wedding, some of the servers took some pictures of some players and some drunken activity. Yep put it on the internet because of the camera phones. And so I think players are a lot more paranoid uh, 
uh, who they can trust and what they can say to who. And, you know, and I find that, and, you know, it's a little different. There's also an age gap now. I'm 60 and they're 27 or something. But there just seems to be very few players who will trust the media. And I understand that because they, there's so much more media now that you don't know everybody if you're a player. And you really have to be careful of who you say what to, and it takes longer to build those relationships. I'm not saying you can't build the relationships, but it takes longer now. Well, that's that's true because that's a good point. I was going to ask you too about like we you see in other newspapers and columnists and stuff, they kind of they move from sport to sport. Like they'll kind of rotate guys. Okay, you're covering the Pirates now. You're going to cover uh, the Penguins, you know, this year and everything. Your career. Was there a season at all where you pretty much, like, you didn't cover the Pirates? I mean, not necessarily the, every day, but it, was there a season where you didn't cover them at all? And that there really, no. No, I mean, I didn't think to so. different degrees. Like, some years I, I worked for some national outlets, so I, I did more national stuff. But, yeah, there was never a time where, where I haven't been around the Pirates, at least some. I mean, uh, right. I would say uh, pr- probably every year I've been to at least half the home games and – Many years I was at every home game, and right. and a lot of years probably two thirds to uh, three quarters of the home games. So, yeah, it's been uh, you know I haven't been there every single game like when I first started and worked at the Beaver County Times and things like that. But I, I'm still around the team, and I, I'd like to at least think that that I have kind of my finger on the pulse of, of what's going on there. Yeah, I, I, I mean talking with you over the years, just at winter meetings and different events and seeing you, I I, I definitely would say so. I mean, you've, you've seen it all with this franchise and like we said, the last 37 years and in, in journalism and everything in, in general, I mean, just being a beat writer that, that long with the team, it, I feel like it's just not a thing you see as much yeah. anymore. The same thing with like, you know, uh, broadcasters that yeah. like have been with the team forever and you know, they're legends and that it's kind of, um, you don't see that as much these days. A lot of guys bounce around. So it's, it's pretty cool that you've been, Pretty much covering the buyer. I don't know if yeah. it's, you, you feel it's cool, but <laughs> sometimes I wonder so what long. might have been. But yeah, <laughs> right. but no, it, it is. And I mean, I, you know, my experience is on the whole been much more positive than negative. Uh, yeah. You know, I can't say everything's been rosy when a team loses as much as they do. There's frayed nerves sometimes, some, uh, yeah. you know, little quick trigger. Uh, temper that some people in the organization might have over something that you write that maybe when the times are better they just you know kind of you know brush it off and say oh well but uh yeah it's been you know it's funny it wasn't my you know i started i was 24 years old in 1988 at beaver county times and I, I pretty much knew it's what I always wanted to do. I, I realized I wasn't a good enough player, you know, once I got past Little League. It's <laughs> like, you know, let's be serious here. You're not going to play in the big leagues, you know. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So uh, I, I always enjoyed writing. I always, and, and this is, again, dating me here by a lot, but the Sporting News, which is now just an online publication, used to be a weekly publication, and it covered all four of the major sports in North America. And they all had te- writers from each city would write little reports on the I, teams. I, and- I subscribed to that. I Every week, you know, would come in, back like the 90s, I was yeah. probably 10 or 12 or whatnot. But I remember I remember getting that and reading every little blurb on yep. the teams, like you said. Absolutely. And I always thought that was cool and yeah. uh You know, and I thought sports writing would be cool. And I was lucky enough when I was 14 years old, I was the statistician for the football team at at my alma mater, Western Beaver High School. Joe Toronto, who was a legendary sports writer, there used to be a paper, it's it's now defunct, it was bought bought out by the Beaver County Times, but it was called the News Tribune and it was in Beaver Falls. And and he would cover, obviously, Beaver Falls would be the main thing he would cover on Fridays, but Western Beaver didn't have lights, so... He would come out on Saturday sometimes and cover those games. Yep. And that's how I got to know him a little bit from keeping stats and, and right. walking along the sidelines with him. And he said, I can't come to next week's game. Do you want to cover it? And I'm like 14, <laughs> 14 years yeah, old. Yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and like, sure. I'll so be- that's how I got started. And, and then it just kind of bled into I was the – the main high school guy for a few years at the Beaver County Times after I graduated college in 85. I was 
I was part-time in, in college for my last three years at Geneva. I went to Geneva College in Beaver Falls. Yep. And then uh, about six months after I graduated, a full-time opening came up. I was looking for other jobs and hadn't been successful finding one, and they offered to promote me, and I said yes. And, you know, when I started baseball in 88, you know, like everyone else, you think you're going to end up at Sports Illustrator or something right. like that. But sometimes the life doesn't turn out the way you think. Well, you did also write for yeah. Baseball America. I did. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. Oh, I'm not complaining. No, uh, no. I, I, uh, you know, I and I just kind of settled in as the way it worked out. And, you know, I mean, I, I it wasn't like my grand plan when 88 to say, well, 37 years later, you'll <laughs> still be covering the Pirates. But, right. you know, I'm not complaining. I mean, it, it's been great. I mean. You know, and, and I've I've been able to kind of have the best of both worlds at times. I've written for Baseball America, USA Today, different places, and yet I've had hadn't had to uproot, and I've been able to stay here in Pittsburgh. And now, one of the most rewarding things I've done in my career is being here at Robert Morris with the future journalist here in the uh, RMU. Uh, you know, in the uh, Academic Media Center here, and people like Casey are who's helping us out here today, and. Uh, it's a lot of fun, uh, you know, to maybe impart a little bit of what I've learned over the years to them as, as they get started on their careers in the media. Yeah, absolutely. And so you brought up about your baseball playing days. I, I had to take this off from your – so you're you're a member of the Beaver County uh, yes. Sports Hall of Fame yes. in 2018, also Geneva College yeah. Athletics They both Hall. ran out of people, so they, <laughs> they said, well, we'll put him in to fill space. Is that what happened? Yeah. So I, I paid Geneva. <laughs> no, I'm. Well, you did pay them to go to school, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's the least uh, they could do is put me in their Hall of Fame. On the Beaver yeah. County Sports Hall of Fame website, they got your your entry here. Did you write this? Who who, who did you do? I wrote here? it. It says anyone who ever watched John Perotto play baseball knew that it was his destiny. Was much more likely to write about it. Did you write that? <laughs> that was me. Yes, that was. I think pretty much anyone would tell me that. It, it was funny, but you know, I. Uh, I played baseball through high school, and uh, I mean, I, I wasn't the worst player, but I certainly wasn't the best player so what, either. What, uh, position? I loved it. I, I played pitcher a little okay. bit, first base, outfield, corner outfield. And yeah. trust me, and as you can see, I'm <laughs> not a center fielder, and right. you know, and I was like, uh, but I enjoyed it. And uh, the one thing I, 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 you know, I was the official scorer. One of them. There's three of them at the All Star Game in 2006 at PNC Park. Yep. And I got a ring for it, and I don't wear it very often. Um, I'm not a showy, flashy type guy. But I did show it to my high school baseball coach and yeah. said, it's one of the few people I've ever actually shown it to, and said, would you believe this? Yeah. And he right? goes, certainly not as a player. <laughs> oh, man. You got a bit of a reputation yeah. there. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I poke fun with it. I love playing, and I mean, in a perfect world, I would have been good enough to, to be a big league player. But right. I pretty much figured I was 12 my last year of Little League, and I looked around our team, which was like 500 record. Yeah. We weren't terrible. We weren't great. And I'm thinking, I'm like the seventh best player on this team. If, if I'm only the seventh best player <laughs> right. on a 500 Little League team, What's my odds of making right. big leagues? So, might, might be a little low. Yeah, so I, I kind of had a little bit of self-awareness at an early age, fortunately. Yeah. And it kind of steered me into this direction. Career. Well, no, it's been great. And, you know, we'll get into kind of talking about the current Pirates. Um, but, I, you know, I, I did want to focus on your career yeah. and just kind of some stories and stuff. Um, you've dealt with, obviously, players back from the Leland Bonds days, like you said, to, to the current players, um, 2013 and all that. Who's who's give me the best player that you've got to deal with, and not just like best as far as like their baseball performance on the field, but best you know to deal with with the media. Because you know I was in media relations, and I can I can name like three people off the top of my head that were unbelievable to work with. And then who was the worst you know player? If you, you have a couple. Well, of head you head. know uh, this is hard because I've been lucky to have very few difficult people to work with with the Pirates. I mean, some guys are obviously more quotable, more open, but, but I've had very few people who've ever actually been mean to me or condescending or anything right. like that. So, so I'm, uh, I'm fortunate. I, I guess, uh, if I had to give some names and I know I'm going to leave some people out, so sorry about that. Craig Wilson would be right at the top of my list. Craig and I remain friends. And that was probably the one where I kind of 
broke or bent that rule about not being friends with the players. <laughs> we just had a, had a really good relationship, and, and really we, we've stayed friends, even though he's been gone almost 20 years now. We right. still keep in touch every so often. Uh, Jason Schmidt wasn't quotable, but when you talk to him off the record – he was hilarious. Yeah. He was a funny guy. So I, I like J- Jason Schmidt. Nate McLeod would have to be out there. Nate, I always used to tease him and call him my little brother because he, we had so much in common, just the way we yeah. thought about baseball and, and things. And, uh, and you go back further. I, I really liked the uh, Jay Bell. Jay was a top notch, great guy. Uh, Doug Drabeck, who won a Cy Young Award and never ever changed. Yeah. And uh, there's a Jim, Go- uh, the, the first player who really took the time to know who I was, my first year on the beat, and get to know me and want to know about where I was from and things like that was Jim Gott, who was the closer on that 88 team. He blew his elbow out the following year and he was never the same pitcher again after he had Tommy John. But Jim was was really a, a wonderful guy, a very personable guy, and and he really took an interest in me. And, and you could tell he genuinely wanted to know, like my background. It wasn't right. just cursory. Where are you from? I mean, but you know, why why do you want to do this and everything? Yeah. And 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 that meant a lot to me, and it made me feel really comfortable. It, it makes a difference. Yeah, when, when you're and it makes you life. feel comfortable when you're going into a clubhouse and you're you know major all major league players, and you're like, oh my god, this is right. like, what do I do? And to have somebody kind of just come up to you and kind of interview you a little bit, right. just really put me at ease. And, and he said, and I remember him and, and Mike Diaz, another player who okay. kind of faded away after a couple of decent years as a kind of platoon yeah. bench guy. And he told me too, he goes, you know, if there's ever anything you need, if you ever have any problems in here with anybody who gives you problems, you come to me and I'll take care of it. And I thought that was really, really nice as a kid starting out that, yeah. a, that a player would, would say that to me and say, basically, you know, I got your back if something happens to you in this clubhouse. And fortunately, I've never had uh, really any major, major dust-ups. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, one, I guess, got popped. When Ian Snell told me that I'd never played in the big leagues and I didn't know, and I said, well, you know, I've written obituaries and I haven't died, so I think I, I know a little bit about it. But, right. But, anyway, no, so, but that was really the only kind. And it, and it got on sports radio and stuff. People play, you know, the next day. And I regretted it. I shouldn't have. I should have just. He got snippy and I got snippy back, and I regretted it. I mean, yeah. I, I'm from the old school where the reporters shouldn't be part of the story, right. just report the story. And, but we kissed and made it. Well, we didn't kiss, but we made <laughs> up, and, right. and everything was fine. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that, like you yeah. mentioned about um, not being part of the story, I, I feel like in that your career, you, you've done that. Like, you yeah. know, I, I think it, most people that have been following or fans of the Pirates – for any bit of time, I think knows your name and knows how long you've, you know, been doing this and, and respect you. And uh, it just, yeah, I don't see it like on videos or, you know, screaming on a ah. reel or something. So that's what we kind of wanted to bring you more to the to limelight here. Cause I, I think, it, I think your story is fascinating as far as what you've seen from the, from the beginning of your career. Now. Yeah. I, I've never been one to really seek out the spotlight. I mean, but you know, I, I appreciate you caring enough to, to want to know, and hopefully I can, Entertain with a few funny stories here and yeah, there. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'll bring up a couple of stories. But um, what, answer me this. I, I guess you've covered a lot of teams. We mentioned only seven winning seasons. What what was like the most enjoy, enjoyable team that, that you've covered? I, I, there are two. And neither in, in, in 90 was an interesting year because five years earlier, the franchise almost got sold and moved right. out of town to Denver. And they'd come all the way back from the brink of leaving to winning the division. Uh, the New York Mets were a very strong team at that point. Gooden, Strawberry, I mean, all the, the big-name players that they had at the time. And the Pirates beat them. And, and they, they won the division. They, they went head-to-head. And all these people always ask, what's your most memorable moment? And it would be in a three-hour stadium on Labor Day night in 1990, a twilight doubleheader. And uh, and Zane Smith retired the last 27 batters he faced for the Pirates. Barry Bonds hit a sacrifice fly, or a single, which would have been, it was near the wall. Normally it would have been a double or a triple. 
but uh, the bases were loaded and they won one to nothing. And, and, you know, I was there. The only thing it compares, well, nothing in Three Rivers. I mean, the, the whole stadium was shaking. I mean, I it was literally that. shaking <laughs> yeah, at, at, the, at the end of the game. And the only thing that we even compare to that would be the 2013 wild card game as far as fan reaction. But that 90 season was fun because, you know, they've been from the brink of, of elimination of the franchise or basically in Pittsburgh to have gone all the way to win the division. And the other one was the 97 team. And I know, you know, they finished 79, 83. And if you don't know the context of it, you're like, well, what was so special about it? It's like another typical pirate season. Right, but, right. but, but if you were there, it wasn't, they were expected to lose like literally 110 games that year. Right. Leland had left. Gene Lamont had, had taken over as manager. They were, had all these kids and journeyman players, and they, they really looked on paper like there's no way this team can't lose 100 games, and that's how bad they were. And they got off to a decent start, and they had ended up – their starting pitching ended up being very reliable. They didn't have a pitcher miss a start until September, and um, they just gelled, and they were in a bad division. I mean, that's yeah. part of it. I mean, they were in a division where Houston won the division with, I, I think, 82 or 83 yep. wins. So, But they hung in it to the last week of the season, and in and, and oddly typical bucko fashion, they were eliminated on an off day. <laughs> they were going to Houston to, to end the season, and if Houston lost to the Cubs on a Thursday night, that would mean if the Pirates could sweep Houston, there would be a one-game playoff for the National yeah. League Central title. Uh, but the Cubs beat the Astros, or the Astros beat the Cubs that night at the Astrodome, and I was there. It was weird covering a Cubs-Astros game. Right. <laughs> but, and that was the end of that. And, uh, you know, but they hung their last week of the season, and it was uh, – it was a pretty cool experience. They had a lot of good guys, and they were truly the underdog team that year. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. They had unexpected, you know, they had Kevin Elster, and then he got hurt. And they had Dale Swaim, who had fallen off the big league map, and he ended up yep. being the shortstop. And Kevin Polkovich, who was uh, a very lightly regarded, uh, wasn't on the 40 man roster, wasn't a top. 20 30 prospect he ends up playing a pivotal role at shortstop and it was just one of those years where they had so many unlikely heroes right. and there were so many good stories it was just it was a fun year and it was it was one of those years usually by september you're tired and you're ready for it and but and that was the one year i really wish they would have made the playoff now i don't yeah. think they would have went very far in the playoffs right. but it would have been a cool story if fun. they made it yeah, yeah. And, and that was you know we always talk about you know, you have all these seasons. Teams eventually, you should just luck into winning yeah. the season. Like, you know, yeah. that was kind of '97. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of that. And you know, I was so young when '90, '91, and '92 yeah. the division titles happened. I, I remember it briefly, but '97 was like the first time. It was like in September. It's like, man, they're they're a game out. You yeah, know? Like they're right there. Yeah. You know, and it was that was kind of the first uh, time. And then you know, pretty much. Any year after that, all the way to 2012, when they when they were over yeah. 500 in yeah. August, and then just had that terrible homestand yeah. and and dropped off the face of the earth. But yeah, like you're like you got to luck into a, a winning season or something eventually. Well, kind of like the Detroit. They, they remind me yeah. very much that's that you know watching this Detroit Tiger team this year that that not only went to the playoffs right. but but upset uh, Houston in the first round. The, they very much remind me of the Pirates. A lot of young guys. I mean, a lot of young guys. They had 11 rookies on their L, L, LC, LDS roster. Right. And they really reminded me of the 97 Pirates. Like, they weren't supposed to win, but, like, they just didn't realize they weren't supposed to win. <laughs> they just did it. Yeah. <laughs> and they, uh, the Tigers, they sold at the deadline, too, which was wild. Yes. And, and still got there. Um, all right. Well, you know, let's let's get into, I guess, the current Pirates, you know, briefly here. Um, I did want to touch on them kind of, you know, they're, they're in that stage where it's, you know, up and coming. You have Paul Skeens. First, let me ask you this, because I know Jim Rosati has said he's the best pitcher he's ever seen. Um, you've watched a little bit more baseball than Jim or I. Is Paul Skeens the best pitcher, I guess, at his age that you've ever seen? Yes. And I would say he's probably, and I, I hate the basis on just 23 career starts, right. but I think in the 37 years that I've been around the Pirates covering them, uh, 
I think he's the best pitcher. With all due respect to Garrett Cole, yeah. who I saw yesterday in Cleveland before game three of uh, the ALCS. Yeah. He's with the Yankees now, of course. And he's fascinated by schemes. We, yeah. we talked for about five minutes, he goes. And even he said, Cole goes, you know, I had a better debut. <laughs> And I looked at him, he goes, I know, he had a bunch better rookie <laughs> Yeah, season. he had a much and better year. <laughs> so, I mean, when, when somebody like Garrett Cole, who obviously knows pitching and, and yeah. is a contemporary, just gushes about this guy to me yeah. for like five minutes, how he was fascinated following him and happy he got a chance to see him pitch in New York in the final weekend of the season, how he had a chance to talk to him a little bit and they talked some pitching. I, I thought that was really cool and really tells you how much uh, respect that Paul Skeens has gained around the big leagues right Great. now when, when everybody wants to see him. I know that other managers would say that before he would start against them. Uh, you know, even though we hate to face him, we, we know it's a tough task. As a baseball fan, you know, I'm like really looking forward to seeing him pitch in person. And yeah, he is not, He I would say nobody has created this kind of buzz with all due respect to Garrett Cole since Barry Bonds came to the big leagues in 86. Yeah, it's hard to put it into words because yeah. what he's done, like you said, so quickly and this year and uh, starting the All Star game, yeah. you know, the first time. Hopefully, I I have a a future bet on him to win the Rookie of the Year. So I'm, um, I, I think he's getting it. I, I think the Raiders I think, will. I think he should. Jackson Merrill had a tremendous year he for the, the Padre center fielder, and I would never take that away from him, but. Skeen's had a historically yeah. good year, and and you know and I'm, I'm not trying to be a homer here by any stretch. Of course, obviously, I saw him pitch a lot. I didn't see Jackson Merrill play in person, right. except for the three days the Padres were in, in Pittsburgh in August. But if Paul Skeen's doesn't win, I I I'd be really su- not surprised. I'd be I, I don't want to say disappointed. It makes me sound like a homer fanboy, but I would be disappointed for him. Yeah. To have that kind of year and not win Rookie of the Year. It's almost, if he doesn't win it, it's almost like they just need to make two awards. Yeah. One for yeah. pitchers, one for hitters. Which I, I've, I've been long an advocate yeah. of that, yes. Because I, you know, I don't know what else. If, if the season Paul Skeens had, you can't get a Rookie of the Year, then you know, yeah. what pitcher would. So, um, so I mean, do you agree? A lot, a lot of people said, you know, this is their best window with Paul Skeens here that they've seen, you know, probably even – Obviously, since 2013 in those years, but probably like I mean, they didn't have that. Yes, they had Garrett Cole, but you didn't have a pitcher like you didn't have a pitcher like Paul Skeens and then Jared Jones and Mitch Keller. Like you have Bubba Chandler coming up. You have a rotation that yeah. almost on paper is set. Like you're you have the hard part done. Do you, do you think this is their best window coming up? And- I, I think it is, and I think they need to take advantage of it and show some urgency this yes. winter, which they. Don't seem to to have when you you talk to them. Uh, I mean, they have him. They have Jones. I mean, let's face it. They're going to trade Skeens after four years. They're not going to hold him to a fifth year because what if his elbow blows out? Then all of a sudden he's got to rehab the next year. Then you're not going to get anything in a trade for him if he can't pitch in his last year before free agency. So I think it'll be very much like Garrett Cole, four years and. That'll be that. That, and he's going to break arbitration records probably exactly. in the first year. And, and I don't think the Mr. Dunning's going to love that. So, no. yeah, it'll, um, you know. No, and, and I mean, they, they've they proven they, they won't have a high-priced guy on their roster. And people say, well, A.J. Burnett. But the Yankees were paying for most of that right. the first, it was a, the first it was a two years. Yeah, yeah it like, was a short-term thing. Yep. Yeah. And then they brought him back for was it the mm-hmm. it was the one year yeah they brought him back for so yeah it, it's just I, I know we talked about we talk about it so much about not not blowing this opportunity take advantage yeah. urgency which is like you know Ben Sherrington and Nutting just never <laughs> urgency is not their uh, not in their vocabulary it seems yeah. like but you know and I, I've said this for the last couple of years I, I just you know obviously Nutting. It isn't a baseball guy. He he puts people in, in place to kind of handle that, sets a budget, whatever. Um, I don't think he has anybody in his ear to kind of walk him no. back to reality and say, "Here's no. you guys need to do this. If if nothing called you today and, and said, John, you've been in this business for so many years, I want your opinion on like what we should do in the next four years. Uh, what what would you, what would your advice be? You know, it would be a conflict advantage? of interest, but I think that, he needs somebody like that. I agree. 
And no disrespect to Travis Williams, but Travis Williams is a hockey guy. It's not a yeah. baseball guy. And, you know, he, Bob wants yes men in his organization. And that's why Ben Charrington never ruffles any feathers. That's why Derek Shelton never mm-hmm. ruffles any feathers. I know they have to be frustrated at times with the low budget. Regardless, I think if you shot them with truth serum, they would tell you, yeah, this is kind of ridiculous to win on having a bottom five payroll every yeah. year. But the advice I'd give him would twofold. I mean, the easy thing is say spend more money, but that doesn't always necessarily equate. If you spend money on the wrong guys, it really doesn't right. matter. I would say one do a better job of having people in your front office that can evaluate talent and find these hidden gems. Like you look at Max Muncy, reached base 12 games in a row for the Dodgers. He got released by Oakland after hitting two home runs in, yep. in one year in the minors. They saw something in him. The Pirates don't find these kind of guys. They shouldn't. The other one I would say would be human. It's like Bob is he's so wooden. He's so stiff and... People, in, I mean, you're a Western Pennsylvania guy. You're yeah. a Pittsburgh guy. I mean, you people like real people yeah. here, and they can spot a phony a mile away. And I'm not saying Bob's a phony necessarily. I just think he needs to loosen up and try to be more of a a people person. Now, I'm not saying he's going to walk through the stands and shake everyone's right, hand right. every day. But come across, just it would be nice one time if they came across that they cared that losing bothered them, and and it, and and they just really, they, they really don't connect with the fans, and no. you know, on on any level, and 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 they, you know, they they think their fans are stupid. A lot of times, they, you know, the way they talk, uh, the way they answer questions to the media are so condescending, and when you're answering questions to the media, you're basically what we do is a conduit between the pirates and the fans because obviously not every fan can come and ask every player you know just walk up or or an executive a question and we try to ask questions that we think the fans would want to ask if they were fortunate enough to be in our position and uh you know some of the things they say like oh we made improvement and you know, you're just insulting like people's weird. intelligence. Yep. It would just a, a little dice of humility would be so nice and say, you know what? We're really tired of losing. It bothers us too. Right. But they give they give the impression it's like, oh well, yeah. it's like well we lost that that's or, okay. Or yeah. oh we're we're following yeah. a plan yeah. and we're it's it's yeah. we're moving in the right direction yeah. and we won more games and it's like no yeah. you didn't. No. You know, Ben's comment that he made yeah. in that presser, you know we're winning more games. Well you didn't yeah. from last year. So no. none of them have a feel for the fans, the people of Pittsburgh. Yeah. People in Pittsburgh, people in Western Pennsylvania, try not just that, tri-state area, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia, Northern Maryland, are genuine people for the most part. And you know this, we were all born with BS detectors. And I mean, especially in this region. And you and they go off when somebody's BSing you. And I just get the feeling just about any time I ever talk to to try you know especially bob nutting which is very rarely avails himself to the media and neither does travis williams but when you do like my bs meter immediately meter immediately starts going like that 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 they're not being sincere and and they're not being realistic with the fans and they think people are stupid enough to believe some of the things they say yeah and the bar is so low, John. I mean, yeah. that's what we've talked about this so, so many off seasons. If they would just go out and, like you mentioned, spending money is not a, a, a guarantee that you're going to win. You got to spend it on the right players and the right team. But you go out and spend, get a bat for fifteen, twenty million, and, and add something yeah. to the payroll. The fans are going to come out. Absolutely, they're going to they're going to see that. They're going to come out. And like you said. The PR, the PR with this team, it, it always seems they just can't get out of their own way. Never. Like the whole rowdy thing with with the four plate appearance, a cent of bonus. I don't even know if that was the reason why they cut him at that point. But the 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 image they give out by how they did it, you know, it gets leaked. It, you know, it gets put out there that this mm-hmm. is why. You know, shout out to Ethan that that kind of yeah. I'll give him, I'll give him credit because I honestly, I mean, I knew what Rowdy's and I mean, I had it. You know, I, right. whenever they sign, you know, I keep track of it, and I I didn't realize it was coming up uh, on four four away, and right. uh, yeah, Ethan Holohan, uh had that yeah. uh, you know 
pointed that out, and I'm like, wow, I, I hadn't really thought about, you know, especially end of the year, things were going bad. Right. You're not even really thinking about that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, and, and it was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I looked, I said, yes, sir, he does indeed four away. And I was like, wow. And that's the thing. And it's like, we're not, I, I don't know if that's the reason why they did it, but sure, it sure looks like it. And, you know, and then, and then two, a week later, they do it to IKF, not cutting him, but they, they sit on the final day. Yeah. And then they go to him and say, well, we gave him the option after we figured it out. And yeah. like, you put him in a bad spot. Yeah. It's, it's just everything they do, they just can't get out of their own way. And it's just, it always seems to be... Um, you know, it's whatever decision it is, it always seems to be the wrong one or, yeah, or whatnot. Always, so, yeah. So it's tough. Um, but you know, I want to wrap up here. I know you got uh, something coming up here. Um, I wanted to ask you about this. You know, your whole spanning your whole career um, in baseball, obviously, obviously with the Pirates. Have you ever thought about um, writing a book? With me, just kind of like your people ask your me that all the time, and I, I, I would I love. It. I'm, I'm a big I, yeah, I, I, I guess yeah, I probably. When I retire or semi-retire, because you know the season is so long and there's something going on every day, and you, you know you always think about, well, yeah, I'll get some free time at the end of the season, and then the off season comes yeah. and there's stuff happens. But yeah, I think I think it would be fun. I don't know if people will be interested, and I think I, that I, I I I think that some people would think that I just made some of this stuff up. That yeah. like it didn't really happen. He just he just right. embellished it. But the stuff would be, yeah, it actually happened, it's believe hard, it or not. So yeah. true, it's hard to believe, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it would be fun to think about doing it. When, yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah. you've told me stories over the years when we met, um, you know, uh, the story about Bonds telling you he, t- he t- what would keep him here was, what, 525? Five years and 25 million. Which is yeah. insane to think about now. But that day, like, that was the biggest, that would have been mm-hmm. the biggest contract. Yep. It's crazy. Um, t- t- before we, we end this, um, and again, thank you so much for your time here. T- tell, tell the Mike Williams story. I know you've told it to me about uh, it, the, the salary, him, him wanting to, mm-hmm. him, him ex- uh, assuming how much you made. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want anybody to think I live on a park bench, that I'm that <laughs> right. destitute. But <laughs> I remember Mike Williams asked me one time that Mike Williams course was their closer in the early 2000s and he goes can I ask you a question and I'm like well yeah I ask you questions so you certainly could ask me one he goes it's a little personal and I said well okay and he goes how much money do you make a year and I figured well we all know their salary, so I mean, if they, I never had anyone ever ask me right. that before <laughs> since right. any baseball player in 37 years asked how much money I made. So I said, what do you think? And he goes, I don't know, 150, 200 grand a year. <laughs> and I said, take that one off the 50 and go a little lower than that, <laughs> significantly lower. I said, and then you're at my... Uh, and then I told him what I made, and he was stunned. Oh, right. He couldn't believe me. He goes, I thought you guys got paid a lot more than that. I'm like, dude, did you ever work in a newspaper? <laughs> right. And, <laughs> but it was funny, and Mike oh, right. was a great guy. And, I mean, Mike, he just he just didn't, didn't know. know. Yeah. I was flattered in a way that he thought I was worth that much money, and I wish I would have taken him in <laughs> to the publisher's office. Right. I worked at the Beaver County Times then and had him so, say, hey, this is Mike Williams, a two-time All-Star. This is how much money he thinks I should make. Yeah, but Mike, can you open your own uh, newspaper uh, sp- or publication? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Now, that's, just, that's great. That's great because, you know, you, you some of these players are just – and he was like a – yeah, like you said, he was from West Virginia. Like he yeah, was he was, local, yeah, he was like a kind of a – yeah, he grew up in a rural area of yeah. Virginia. I, you think yeah, he would have had like yeah. a, a – you know, just some of these, these ball players they're just – their yeah. reality is a little yeah. different, you know. Yeah. <laughs> when they start making Yeah, it, it really is. But – yeah, but that was that was always a, yeah that's always a funny story to think back on, and I really like Mike a lot, and I uh, it, it was just funny. So you wonder, and I never I never, but I've often wondered. I've often wanted to go to other players in like the subsequent twenty some years ago. Right? How much money do you think I make? <laughs> right. And see yeah. if they all think that, take or if that was just yeah, or if that was like They're like man, how yeah. much do they, how much they think the broadcasters and everybody yeah. make? You wonder, but. Um, let me ask you about one last player, a uh, pretty polarizing player this year, Rowdy Telez. What, you know, he, he comes in, he's, you know, he's, he's terrible at the plate to start. 
he sticks up for Bednar in that first mm-hmm. month, and he's just um, you know he sticks up for him. It kind of backfires on him because he wasn't performing well. Uh, what's what's just your overall? Thoughts on the year and Rowdy Tellez as a, as a guy? You know, he had quite the year. He went from being the villain to everybody's hero. Uh, the curtain call. I, I didn't particularly like when he called the fans out about Bednar. I thought yeah. you're five home games into your Pirate career. You don't know what Pirate fans have been through. You don't know all the BS that they yeah. have been put through by this organization and this ownership. So I think you might want to tread lightly on telling the fans not to boo. I asked Bednar about getting booed, and he goes, oh, I've been sitting in the stands booing people before. <laughs> right. He goes, I know how that works. I'm from here. Yep, he gets you know, it. <laughs> and there was only like 100 people in the stands yeah. that day. And I, just, and I know his intention was good. Yeah. He wanted to stick up for the fact that David had got booed off the field that day against the Tigers. But to say we don't do these things here, you've been here a week. Like, you don't know what we do. You're not part of we yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's where the backlash came yeah, from. Yeah, that was, fans. yeah. And, you know, it was nice to see him stick up for a teammate, but it was probably but, not the, the but right. But, you know, he turned his exactly. season around and he won his fans, and I think after he was here longer, people realized he's a pretty cool dude. Yeah, and then he's yeah. pitching, uh, yeah. three, what, three Four, games? Three Four, games in 12 in, days. In like 12 and, days. I mean, just yeah. crazy stuff. Just yeah. a, as, as far as a, a year of a player has, that's got to be yeah. one of the weirdest, like, up, yeah. uh, you know, up and down seasons yeah. that I, I remember anyway. But, um, but anyway, John, I, you know, I appreciate again uh, talking with us here for a little bit. Anything you want to say or before we I, I just want to say how much I enjoy North Shore 9. I think you guys uh, do a great job. Sometimes I think you do too great of a job. You're, <laughs> taking, you're taking eyes away from, from what I do because your stuff's better. No, but uh, no, seriously, you guys do a great job, and you can tell how much you love the Pirates and baseball in general. It just right. just comes through, and I think you guys have a great sense of humor about it, and uh, we're, we're it's just to. fun uh, it's just uh, I, I just like the vibe of I, I got to have met most all of you now and uh, always and always enjoy running into you guys and uh, you know and I'm happy you're doing well and uh, I like to see you guys just keep growing and growing and, and doing more and more neat stuff. Uh, we appreciate that. I, I give the props and I didn't even pay him to say that. So, uh, but I give the props to Donardo and Jim for Where's my money. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no not give me five. Where's my money? <laughs> So, but no, I appreciate that, John. Like I said, all the time we run yeah. into each other, we, yeah. we enjoy it. So, uh, but that's it. Uh, again, live from Robert Morris, uh, John Parado, and uh, this is North Shore Nine. We'll see you guys later. Peace. Well, thank you for watching. I know we try to provide the most entertaining content that we can, uh, and we'd love to spread it to as many people as possible. So, uh, I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you could take the five seconds to like this video, and subscribe to the page. It helps out so much more than you know. Thank you, and let's go Bucks.